Hi, welcome to the start of my brand new podcast called the Mormon History Hoedown. Uh, you're just in time for my very first episode. So let me reintroduce myself. Some people call me Nuance Ho. Some people call me, some people have been calling me the director of a 501c3 nonprofit called the Nuance Hug Foundation. But I'm, I just like going by Kara Burrell. So hi, I'm Kara. I'm a comedian, and I have been helping people in faith transition on social media through podcasts and shorts for about three years now. I was the co-host and producer at Mormon Stories podcast from about 2021 to 2022, and my goal is to explain Mormon history and concepts and bring more lulls and validation to the religious deconstruction space. I don't have any degrees, but I just have a lot of time spent in, in, you know, comedy clubs, in Salt Lake in LA, and I spend a lot of time trying to understand the challenges uh, Mormons and ex-Mormons face. So I'm excited to finally produce a podcast on all topics relating to history and overall deconstruction full time. So after several years in the post-Mormon commentary and satire space that you have hopefully come to know and love from me and let me test your limits on, let's do it as a podcast. You know me. You know, I can, I can tell you everything that you want to know about Mormonism. So I thought, let's do it as a podcast. So I gave a lot of thought to what I wanted this first episode to be. And I think it's a good start to tell you about my Mormon history. So I'm going to try to not just retell my Mormon stories interview, but hopefully be a lot more vulnerable with y'all and uh, tell the story of what church I belong to and why I loved it and what caused me to leave. And what made me wake up one day and say, oh, it's not a true thing. What do I do now? I can go anywhere. I can go anywhere, just not home, to quote Taylor Swift. So I gave a lot of thought. And uh, the introduction I'd like to start with, Will Dollins. I reckon I've seen it all in this uh, wild, wild west of Mormon deconstruction. I've seen TikToks like thunderstorms strip the faith off of stake precedents. I've ridden shotgun with John Daly and through mom and stories episodes with LDS apologists so devoid of logic that even the cacti withered and died. But let me tell you, we're not too unlike that cacti who are driven by genetic programming and environmental responses. When understanding the truth of the religion that you're born into feels like a bone-chilling blizzard that keeps you inside, scrolling on Reddit for days. It's the kinship of the folks who wash each other's backs and the kindness of strangers sharing a meme and the love of one's family that you will undoubtedly probably have to now live without. All who travel the untamed frontier with us every step of the way. So when the dust settles and the faith crisis is over, remember, our existence is painted with a broader brush than just its struggles. Life's essence transcends the challenges of trying to understand every way you had information systemically hidden from you. It's the love, the laughter, and the stories you heard on a podcast once, shared around the fire, that keep our spirits alive. New episodes of the Mormon History Hoedown will be dropping this week and every week on the Nuance Ho YouTube channel. So hit the subscribe button and hit the bell for notifications for updates. And I will be available to do Mr. Rogers like dressings and undressings and characters every week and everything will be available in podcast form. If you are a donor to this channel, let me just tell you at the beginning how much that means to me and you're going to love all the cool things that I have in store for you. And I'm having a launch party in Salt Lake. So if you're around on September 9th, you can find more information about that in the description below. So, like I said, putting a lot of thought to how I wanted to tell my my Mormon history for this hoedown, this first episode. I was born in Redford, Michigan, in the year of our Lord, Taylor Swift, 1989. My mom is from Detroit, and she converted to the Mormon church when she was 12 years old. And my dad is from Port Clinton, Ohio, and he converted when he was in his early 20s. So for my mom... She told me that her dad was, you know, an alcoholic and 
that she associated people who went to church as good people who had their lives together. And my dad was the type of guy who was just kind of in and out of jail for weed and being a traveling hippie, traveling the country. You know, my my pop, he uh, can't, he's the type of guy who he can't give blood anymore because of all the drugs he was shooting up in the 70s. And a favorite quote of mine and my sister's growing up was him telling us, Kids, never do heroin because it is so good. So you can picture these two people looking for some structure and some spiritual direction in their lives, and Mormonism seemed to be that direction, if I'm speaking as nuanced and honestly as possible. Um, Yeah, it probably did give them some good direction, and they wouldn't have been the first. And I could say that maybe if they didn't join the church, you know, otherwise— their lives could be very different and I don't fault them or look down on my parents or really anyone who's trying to, you know, better themselves. And they think that the answer lies in this high demand style religion. But, uh, for me, it just became a matter of if it is true though, are the structures and the authority that you're committing to follow to stake your life to, are they actually in alignment with what I believe is a literal actual truth from like a historical perspective and also a spiritual perspective, uh, because structure and some, you know, strict morals to live by, they can become very counterintuitive to one's progress. And if they aren't rooted in much more than the declarations of, you know, 80 or 90 year old men who claim to be prophets, seers, and revelators, but, uh, every few years reveal themselves to be products of their time. So there's there's a unique type of disappointment and fear um, that convert parents go through when their children turn away from the faith that it's like they found it. Like, you know, out in the world, there's a there's messy satanic forces. Stay here. Stay in where you're safe. Don't go out looking for the truth. We found the truth so that you don't have to go through what we went through. And there's this nice community and there's the safety. And as much as on the surface Mormonism can appear that way, it actually is it actually is quite unsafe for the soul. The disappointment, I guess you could say, from my parents' perspective, um, that they feel in me, uh, not just leaving, but doing what they call now with this nonprofit and everything I've been doing with Mormon Stories, what they call, you know, slashing and dashing the church, to use my mom's words. The church is, and the church, though, is in and of itself, though, it's a dogma and it's an inflexible belief. It's an inflexible belief that that is there because the church told them that this is the only way to have a good life. This is the only way to be blessed by God and to return to him. So on one hand, that inflexible belief of what makes Mormonism appealing, that you found the true church, but it's not that it's it's actually true. It's really more that people sometimes are just very incapable of nuanced thinking and a religion like Mormonism, I think exploits that to, to tie yourself to it for a life to serve its interests first and tell you obedience, the first law of heaven. So I try to help people who have been so afraid of questioning and have so much internalized shame from Mormonism, realize that you can, and you should stand in your own power. Like you have so much more than the box that, you know, the Mormon teachings have put you in. And it feels like everything about being a God and eternal salvation, all of this is just like a carrot that's dangling on the stick of your family can be together forever. This is where the blessings are. But there's just so many uh, hoops that are just not meant for human hoop jumping. And I'm not even just talking about, you know, word of wisdom and leaving the living the commandments and obeying the law of chastity. I mean, real spiritual hurdles of confinement that are just not meant for our, that our, our human spirits to flourish within. And I get to this point now when I'm starting this podcast where I feel like the, the spiritual experiences that, that I had and that Mormons had within Mormonism, it's just, they don't equate to Joseph Smith being a prophet who restored this one, one true church. And so therefore, if you leave it, it means you do so by the enticings of Satan. And I don't do so by the enticings of Satan. And I don't think any ex-Mormon does. 
And, you know, I don't claim to speak for all ex-Mormons, but for me and most of the people I know, we did so by the enticings of our inner knowing and our personal growth that was stagnated, that we belonged to a church that told us to be like Jesus, be honest in our dealings with our fellow men, be inclusive and love your family and your friends and your community and mourn with those that mourn. But what do you do when people in your community are mourning and you're told that you are, you're empathizing with the wrong people. And when we, we do act on those things, the authority that once taught us about Jesus Christ is now punishing us for not actually following Jesus Christ as they interpret Jesus Christ. So a lot of the reasons why I left center around a real wholehearted disagreement with who Jesus Christ is. Even if I met you at the he is God table, okay? Like how devoid of, of the good teachings, the wisdom, the love, the peace of that deity, as I understood it when I was in the church and, and, and as I understand it out of the church, just it's not in alignment with the God that, that the Mormon leaders teach and the God of the Mormon doctrine, which ultimately likes to tell you that it is the one true church on earth, that the, the Book of Mormon is the most correct book on earth and that you can grow closer to God by abiding by its principles than by any other book. And finding that to be wholeheartedly, completely untrue by every single metric that I know of. To begin my story, my parents joined the church while, you know, living lives that were in disarray. But what if the disarray is actually the dogmas that the brokenness that the members feel when, you know, their kids leave or way that when they themselves doubt their faith, that that is actually placed there by men in the religion itself in a way that it is there to further themselves, but in actuality creates the furthest distance from God possible. So it is a journey of me realizing that what if the sacred parts of Mormonism, the temple, all of these things are only sacred to a believer that actually come at a really high cost. And that cost is, is walking all over the actual objective inherent sacredness of each human being and their autonomy. And it does it in the most disrespectful, sacrilegious ways and things that, that would, would, would separate someone from their inner knowing and forces them to believe that they don't have the capacity for healthy self-determination without this corporation or its structures. And I think that, again, is just completely out of alignment of what Jesus Christ taught. And we all have these things, you know, in our life that make us feel broken but the answer is not tying ourselves to dogmas that disrespect the sacred and beautiful within ourselves and to beat up our intuition and force it into submission to believe that we deserve to be separated from our maker. That, that if we don't follow these things, it's us sending ourselves to hell, actually. It makes perfect sense in the plan, right? <laughs> like I, that There's just nothing that should separate us from our families and separate us from, from our divinity and our power as a means to heal that brokenness. So it's just that type of inflexible thinking and uh, gatekeeping that gatekeeps, you know, your compassion and just makes a mess of some of our best human instincts to serve others. And that at the end of the day is just an idea that when you're Mormon, who God is and what he expects of you only really exists in your head and everyone else has a slightly different version of what that that something is, what they, that idea is that is supposed to be a universal truth even. But no one, not even the prophets, have an inside track of you know what God's mind is as much as they proclaim that they do, if he exists at all, right? So I, I tell this story um, and how I came to realize that this faith that I was brought up in was untrue. Um, I hope that you can see that I didn't leave because I hated God and I hated goodness and I just love sin. And, uh, I mean, you're going to think whatever you're going to think from your conditioning. It doesn't matter, but 
Um, I, uh, I didn't leave because I didn't want to be called out on my sins or something. It was because I saw the structure. I saw what places elevated my spirituality and my consciousness, but came to realize that I am good, that we are good, that we Mormons, that we are so much better than this church and its hate and its cruelty and its disrespect and its pridefulness. And it needs to be called out. So, uh, my parents really don't like that I left the church or talk about it. And especially upset that I have kind of drawn this line in the sand. Um, and I'm starting this podcast a nonprofit. And of course it makes perfect sense why they would think that all I do is slash and dash the church again to use their words. But, um, I know the pain of a faith crisis and I've lived through it and I've interviewed so, so many people. And the truth is Mormons, members of the church, uh, you know, they don't really have any rights like any good authoritarian church that claims to speak for God. <laughs> so it's just, what do you do when you, you disagree with those God speakers and you are the one that needs to change, not them, that there aren't a whole lot of ways, you know, when, when you want to distance yourself from their lives, there aren't a whole lot of ways to leave with your dignity and integrity, to leave as a whole person. And it takes a lot of time and love to deconstruct that. So there aren't a whole lot of ways to reform the church's dogma that, you know, still can corrode minds of people even after they've left. So it's like ex-Mormons, people who come to realize that this church isn't true anymore. It's like, we're just talking here. We're just talking about our experiences. We didn't start this fire. Uh, we are all members of the human race and we have been slashed and dashed first by an unaccountable corporation that, you know, gatekeeps our families and gatekeeps our worth based on the whims of 80, 90 year old old men. So being someone who was separated from all my extended family in Ohio and Michigan, because uh, my mom had a dream that we could only live a good life if we moved out West to be by more Mormons. And the unique experience of being raised again by, by Mormon converts and what that means to leave the church that they found for you is just kind of a major theme of my life. So after uh, my parents got married in the Washington, D.C. temple, they had five kids, Aaron, Ben, Allison, Bethany, and me. And uh, so this is where it has to get serious. This is where the trigger warnings come up. So uh, what are my wounds? Thought you'd never ask. Um, where did all this brokenness come from that I filled with religion? Thanks so much. I'll get right into it. Talking about this is, is first and foremost, it's going to get me into a lot of trouble, but I don't care. Um, it's my life. We're going to be talking about it. So here it goes. Um, I, I don't talk a lot about being molested for the early part of my childhood out of a lot of fear that the person who did it would feel bad. And I truly, truly understand you know, why he did it and the, the shitty circumstances that, you know, he was forced to live in that led him to do the things that he did. But because my oldest brother is, is deaf and has Asperger's and just lives in a world that was not made for him to function in, uh, all that can be true. Well, also it doesn't excuse me from, you know, the ways that it's affected me and, uh, affected pretty much every aspect of my life. So my, my childhood was not peaceful. My, my dad didn't learn sign language. Everyone was always screaming. My parents, eh, you know, I'm the fifth, but I still can say that they probably had too many kids. Uh, we probably should have stayed, you know, either living in Ohio or Michigan instead of moving out to Arizona and Utah. Um, so our house was, could have been a lot less dysfunctional if my dad could have actually lived with us and, helped raise us instead of staying in Ohio. And, you know, just that leading to us being just incredibly poor and stressed and, but Hey, things, things played out the way that they did. And I don't fault anyone for doing what they thought was the best thing to do within their ability to do something and what they could achieve at that time. But now the stage telling my story, I'm my own person and I get to talk about, this situation that it created and, uh, the home that I lived in. So yes, I would say that 
a lot of my Mormon story starts with some of my deepest wounds that are around abandonment. And that manifested as a toddler who wanted their mommy, but you know, she has a million other tasks to tend to and a dad who never seemed to want to be home and always worked and lived in an entirely different state. And that manifested in me having like a lot of abandonment around my sister, having a lot of friends and me not having any, not having any playmates or anyone to talk to or spend time with. And, uh, that pain of rejection kind of forcing me to be okay with taking off my clothes and having very gross things done to me that no child should ever see out of just wanting to have a playmate. And the fear of rejection from family and friends and God made me kind of live in a, in a space of fear um, to be kind of overly sensitive of being left. So my earliest memories and connection with who God was when I was raised Mormon had a lot to do with a God who wouldn't abandon me, who loved me, who had a plan for me. And I always was a, was a comedian growing up in my family and just trying to make my siblings laugh. And that person is still the girl, you know, and love today, but, um, just, yeah, doing things to, for attention and making people laugh and getting people to want to spend time with you. And I always felt like God gave me like this unique voice and he'd be damned if I, I let any bullies or, or hatred of my body creep in there. And it was, it was kind of a, as healthy of a version of God as you could possibly manufacture to kind of get me through, um, a lot of deep, dark stuff. So the God that I worshiped from a very young age was a very personal God that told me that I didn't deserve anything that happened to me and I shouldn't put my light under a bushel. So with that, like I, I promised God that, you know, I will be a good kid. So I, I was a good Mormon kid and I had a fun gaggle of Mormon friends in Provo, Utah and went to a mostly all Mormon high school. Uh, but sexuality and knowing about this whole other world from such a young age that is, you know, just so taboo to your friends and to your religion does have so much shame attached that even with everything I just said, trying my hardest just to be a good kid and know that God loved me. Uh, you can't separate how much, how much shame is still going to be attached to that and having this deep, dark kind of secret that is, you just have no way of knowing how to navigate. And so it just compresses and, and compressed and got deeper and darker and more painful over time until that pain of just, yeah, being different and overwhelmed. It just, it had to come out. So some of my happiest spiritual experience though, are honestly being able to have friends within the church that I was able to, to talk to and feeling like they were servants from God that were meeting me at the right place and the right time that, that he was showing his love for me by, by the Mormon friends that I had. And I, I always believed the church was true. And it's like, I only had inputs of good fruits around me. So as I grew up and I'm just, I'm just convinced every day, you know, that that was the case. And I, uh, I knew that for me to be able to live within the rules and its confines of Mormonism, I was going to have to take my relationship with God really seriously. And Yes. Like I had, I had to get very serious at a very young age about what my worth was before God. And if I couldn't, and I didn't, there's just a whole host of demons waiting to bash down the door that was just ever present. So there was, um, this day that will live in my mind forever. Um, so when the, the abuse, um, stopped when I was around seven years old, right before I got baptized. And I never really knew why it stopped. Um, so that would have been around second grade. So flash forward, I'm in fifth grade. It's December 21st, 1999. And I remember walking down the stairs. It was my older brother's birthday. And I see my mom crying and my sister, Bethany, consoling her, then my brother, Aaron, standing over and I just knew that whatever was happening was going to be a big deal. I was like, did dad die? What's going on? So my mom takes me in her bedroom and she tells me that my brother told me everything that happened. And I don't need to get into any, any more details than that. But 
when you're a kid and you really don't know what you're supposed to do with a lot of this information, you don't know how much you're responsible for. And it's, it's, it's painful to not, to look back now and not have the type of reassurance that maybe I would give my child if something like that happened to them, but that's fine. I don't fault my parents for not showing up the way that is healthier that I would have liked them to. But my mom takes me in her bedroom and tells me that she knows everything. And my brother wanted to come clean. And she just asked me a bunch of questions that just made me kind of disassociate and were just like, did you guys have oral sex? I'm like, what does that mean? And I don't know what I'm, am I confessing? Am I, what do, what do you need to know any of this for? And she's telling me that my brother's going to go confess to his bishop and the deaf ward. And I don't know what any of this means. I'm a child. I have, I have this freaky flash forward that, that I have this idea that my brother's bishop is going to be reading out a list of sins over the pulpit. Like, I don't know what that even means. What do you mean he's confessing to his bishop? So I am just trying to pretend like, Oh, it's not a big deal. You know, while I'm, I'm panicking inside and, um, wasn't put in any kind of therapy or anything. And all I was told was like, yeah, this kind of thing happens. And, uh, anyway, um, we'll check on you in six months. And I made sure six months later to avoid my parents at all costs. Cause I, I don't, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how to talk about it. And I definitely don't want to talk about it with you guys. So it just kind of went buried down and, from, from around, around that same time, I started to feel like, uh, you know, fifth and sixth grade, my, my biggest coping mechanisms started to become, uh, that I believed that God loved me no matter what. Um, I believed in masturbation, definitely worshiped on the altar of oral B and it's electric toothbrushes and comedy. <laughs> so, um, there's even a time where like, you know, I was making out with my little fifth grade boyfriends and stuff, but like there was a time when I was 12 and I remember I was laying my head down to go to sleep and thinking how grateful I was to be Mormon and have these rules to live within because I'm like, I, I know for sure I'm a 12 year old. I was like, I know for sure that I would have, I've been making out with my boyfriends and stuff. I was like, I know that I would definitely have had sex by now if it wasn't for the church and things like that make me go good. <laughs> good Kara. I'm glad that at least you had some type of structure and you had a God that was like, don't do that. Like you are safe. You are loved. You can put these feelings aside. You know what sexuality is. You can masturbate. That is fine. And I will prepare a nice, lovely priesthood holder that will treat you well for one, one day in the future. But like I said, one of my greatest coping mechanisms was through comedy and it's just watching comedy, watching the Simpsons, making jokes, watching really funny movies, being obsessed with Chris Farley and SNL and Jim Carrey movies and making jokes and impersonating comedians and just trying to do life, doing everything that I could in the funniest way possible in the funnest way possible. Cause everything else just seemed like a waste that why can't we just do things in the funnest way possible. And year after year, it just started. To, I, I realized that it wasn't like a childhood phase that, that comedy was like my way to get through life. And because I was raised in like such a hot furnace and I coped then by like always finding the bright side, always looking for the funny side of things. However, I could make myself laugh and cheer myself up, whatever made me uncomfortable or annoyed or sad um, you know, I started to write funny satirical songs about, and for that, like I count myself very, very lucky because I was, I was raised in a ward with hilarious friends and hilarious leaders in Provo, Utah. And I had some of the best people to look up to. And so throughout my, my teenage years, there were a lot of turning points for me. I was raised in this, it's called the ninth ward, Edgemont Stake, Provo, Utah, and my friends' moms, you know, like most teenagers, you don't want to listen to your parents. You think that they're kind of judgmental and rude and stuck up. So you go to your friends' houses. And I, again, count myself as so lucky that I was raised by such highly intelligent, emotionally intelligent, intellectual, hilarious, wonderful women. And I can, I can never thank them enough for seeing really good things in me that other people didn't see. But when I did my Mormon Stories interview... And I was talking about these women that just, you know, helped instill such great confidence and stuff in me. 
I was like, I knew that they were going to launch that episode and they did. And they did reach out and they're all still lovely, wonderful people. And, uh, and now I feel like I'm like, I should just name names to be very specific because people have to know who some of these women are. For example, if you've ever taken a creative writing class from Mary Lee or traveled to <laughs> Europe with, uh, her husband, the French professor, um, I'm talking about some of the most badass, intelligent, wonderful people. And if anyone's like, oh, you're talking Mary Lee raised you. That's why you're so awesome, Kara. It all makes sense now. Yeah, exactly. It all makes sense now. So women like her and yeah, my other friends, moms who had the way of, of teaching me the gospel and the way that they saw it. And they're still, they're still faithful, active Mormons. You know, there's just a lane within Mormonism where I saw, I saw really good people again, just people who wanted to, to love others as Jesus loved them. And that's kind of what the church meant to me, that, that God was sending his servants to show up for me and tell me that I was loved. When, when your leaders can see something in you and encourage that. And as a, as a young female in the church, I didn't have a lot of the negative perceptions around gender inequality because the way that I was raised, we, we stood up for ourselves and so in some ways that made it all the harder to leave the church because my, my positive perceptions about the church and what it was, was just so different than the reasons why other people left. I didn't see what their big deal was. And there were times and like, I played basketball and stuff growing up. And I remember once in Sunday school, me and my friends, we were uh, listening to a lesson from brother Woodfield and his, his, he was a little bit different. His kids were homeschooled. He was of a, he, he was, he was, he was on his own level, but I remember he was like giving us this lesson about how to use God and pray to God and use the spirit. And he's like, you know, sometimes when I'm playing church ball, every time I'm past the ball, I pray, God, what would you have me do with this ball? And me and my friends are like, are you an idiot? <laughs> and we're just like, no. And I remember it wasn't even me leading the charge. Like my other friends were like, after class, we're going to go talk to the bishop and go tell him that Brother Woodfield shouldn't teach lessons anymore because he doesn't know anything about the spirit. He doesn't know anything about like personal revelation and the ways that God actually wants us to use our intuition. And it was like, yeah, you know. And there was one time when I was like 16 and in the Mary Lee's backyard with all my friends and these leaders. And I was like, you know, my mom was talking about polygamy the other day. And she's like, yeah, you know, Kara, polygamy totally makes sense because I just don't believe that one woman can satisfy all of the sexual needs of one man. And I was like, what do you think about that? That's what old Carol believes and waiting for responses. And Mary goes, <laughs> she's like, oh, no, I shouldn't say this. And we're all like, what? And she goes, no, Carol, one man cannot possibly satisfy all the sexual needs of one woman. And all of us are like, oh, you know, like we had a better, happier outlook of like, whatever this bullshit is that just makes you confined to your place as a woman, you, you can just discard it. You don't need that. You can be as powerful and confident as you want. And your sexuality is not something to be ashamed of. And it's just these beautiful little gems of, of reassurance that I had throughout my teenage years. And again, those things were Mormonism to me, the way that I interpreted the Mormon God can only be you know, made sense of by my conditioning and those inputs around me. So, uh, this leads me to where, when I was in my Mormon stories interview, I talked a lot about, yes, like coming up and, and having these leaders who really encouraged me in my comedy. And there's these different turning points where I wrote different songs, the different satirical songs about my life as a teenager forced, forced me in this direction with so much encouragement that, this is not just a phase like, Carrie, you're really good at comedy. And each time I performed one of these songs, just something major and life-changing kind of happened that forced me in that direction to take comedy seriously and like consider it as a career, you know, as I graduated high school. So when I was on Mormon Stories and John was like, oh, you should have brought your guitar. You should play some songs. I'm like, no, thanks. I was like, absolutely not. It's one of those, it's not even a good idea. I don't want to. <laughs> but now that I have my own podcast and I think it's important to kind of bring you back into my world of what I mean by like who I was and what type of stuff I was writing about and the reasons why like my direction was changed so much by some of these songs that I wrote. So the first one, I think the the first one was when I was a junior in high school, 
Tim Pugh High School, 1,200 kids. It really is like describing a movie to you right now of when you were just writing songs in your bedroom for your friends to laugh at at girls' camp, and you finally get the chance to sing your stupid little song about satirizing all of the popular girls in high school right to their stupid faces <laughs> and uh, do it to a crowd of 1,200 kids who are just like crying with laughter, screaming, and just the the awe and applause. I was like, I, I love this. I need to do this forever. So here's, um, here's like one verse. And of course I'll sing teenage girl. And I have to hold my guitar very awkwardly. You thought it was just for the intro. You didn't know that I was going to dazzle you. All right. This is highly uncomfortable and I'm going to have to move my chair. I wake up every morning with my brat t-shirt on. Are you awake, sweetheart, says my fashionably cool mom. I step into the shower filled with nine dollar shampoo. Then wash my face with Neutrogena, like all the cool girls do. Then it takes me an hour just to do my hair. Another 90 minutes deciding what to wear. Cause I'm just a teenage girl, a regular teenage girl. I jive to school with our exchange student, Horatio, as I blast Justin Timberlake on the radio. I get to school and buy a sugar-free fruit punch, then ask my friends if they'd like to go to Cafe Rio for lunch. I walk in ten minutes late to PE class and put on shorts that ride halfway up my I'm just a teenage girl, a regular teenage girl. Hi, I'm my name's Sandy, and I'm just a teenage girl. I wear lots of lip gloss and perfume that makes you hurl. Gotta get home, gotta watch the OC, then download songs on my MP3. Told you once, and I'll tell you again. If you don't like Abercrombie, then you're not my friend, because I'm just a teenage girl, a regular teenage girl. And it goes on like that. Massive applause. Finally, Kara's on the map. She's a nobody. She's that weird girl that no boys liked, and she's always saying stuff in class and why are you, why is Miss Gleason reading her paper in front of the class? Finally, I'm walking down the halls and people are like, that girl is funny. Let's give her the superlative of best sense of humor, which I did win. I was, it was stolen from me in middle school, but high school I redeemed myself. And again, to just explain that I grew up in a furnace of some of the funniest people <laughs> ever. And at girls camp, you know, you go away for like five or six days for Mormon girls camp. And for your sixth year, they had where I grew up, this Maya Shalom pageant where, you know, anyone who thought they were funny do this pageant and there'd be an interview portion and a talent portion. I wasn't, I didn't even win. And I shouldn't have won. Chelsea Osbourne was the funniest. Sarah Christensen absolutely beat me. But the last portion was the talent portion. And I knew that I needed to pull out the stops because I'm like, they are kicking my ass right now. <laughs> and I had this pavilion, of, you know, hundreds of Mormon girls from my stake. And in the back, they had like the priesthood leaders who like stick around to make sure everyone's following the spirit. Got to have the priesthood leaders there. And I was like, okay, I'm going to sing a song for my talent portion. And I'm about to be inappropriate. And this is what I mean by the type of self-confidence that I had as a teenager. Like, hi, I'm about to be inappropriate. I'm losing. And I'm going to sing a song about my period. If you don't like it, this is a girl's camp. All right. I just like stared down the priest. I was like, this is a girl's camp. You have been warned. And so I pick up my guitar and the, the song that I sang, I'll just play a tiny bit of it. But it's actually adorable. My daughter can play this song by ear on the on the piano now, so. Mr. Period, I hate you very much. You show me things I wouldn't ever want to touch. Every month you unleash a flash flood. And every month you leave me covered in blood. It's a good thing you don't have a wife. Cause if you did, she would stab you with a knife. Stab you with a knife, Mr. Period. Oh, how you annoy. Why don't you go and bother the boys? I feel sick and I think I'm gonna faint, cause I've got cramps like you've got complaints. You owe me money from what I've spent on pads. It isn't easy trying to buy them with your dad. Something, then it goes something, uh, and then it gets really dark at the end, and it's like, 
I hate you for the discomfort that you cause I'll be dead by the time I reach menopause I'm finished, you just aren't any fun Tomorrow's my operation My operation Anyway, I guess you're not supposed to talk about how you don't like being a woman and having that at girls camp because I've... <laughs> I've told a couple of ex-Mormon friends the lyrics of that song. They're like, that's not even inappropriate. I was like, well, the leaders had a problem with it. but And um, and then it was actually Mary Lee, my, my young woman's leader, my camp leader. She's the one who gave me the inspiration for a song called Textual Relations. And when I was 18, I graduated from high school, and like all my friends were, were going to BYU and they just seemed like everyone had a path to like marry their missionary that they were waiting for and, you know, get an MRS family degree from BYU. And I wasn't smart enough to get into BYU, nor did I really want to go to school. I tried going to UVU, but I just was wanted to listen to comedy. And I would just sit there in the foyer in between classes and watch comedy and study comedy. And my mom was actually, for some reason, some glitch in the matrix, <laughs> My mom was pretty encouraging of my comedy career, even the inappropriate songs, because I think she just really saw that, like, Kara, I'll give it to you. You're funny. <laughs> so she she helped me uh, find a producer and help record all of these songs and stuff. And there, they, she signed me up for a, a stand-up comedy class. So when I was, like, 18 and 19, um, started doing stand-up and writing jokes. And then I went to go perform at these open mic nights. But it was funny because... The the third night that I was there was the night that I met my husband, Aaron Burrell. I had my braces off for about two weeks. I was on the market, and no, I wasn't. I I I, oh, I wanted to get married. I wanted to have sex. I wanted to have a boyfriend. I, there's a lot of things that I wanted, but I still had a lot of discomfort with anyone that, looking at me in a sexual way. As a 19 year old, I was like, I am a child. If you like me, you're gross. <laughs> but I still like to write a, write a lot of songs that had some uh, serious satirical sexual innuendos. So the third night that I went to this open mic night, Aaron Brell was the was the MC. So he's the one who and had me come on stage. And then if you can just imagine a comedy club, like 30 kind of gross guys. And uh, <laughs> my two my two other female friends in this comedy class came with me. And they were there cheering me on. And I played this song, Textual Relations crushed it and got a husband out of it. Um, so I'll play you a tiny bit of it just for funsies. Cause this is, this is my history and this song changed a lot for me. All right. Let's text. Got a text from a number that I didn't recognize But now I know it was from you and your love was in disguise My heart goes pitter patter and my phone buzzes and it's you But sometimes I get sad when your love's too good to be true Every time you text me I have to gain my composure But I only have 300 texts and baby, I'm over Text to all the relations Got my heart spinning all around my dad is angry, my teacher's mad because I can't put my phone down. A text to all the relations and keep me warm at night. How can something so wrong make me feel so right? When I see you in person, I don't know what to say It's awkward and we know it cause we've never talked this way I'll text you till midnight and I'll text you till two Baby, I just love having text with you We've been through so much and through so many changes I would express my gratitude but it would take two pages And there's a part that goes like Sorry baby, I'm busy, I can't text you today Nah, I'm just kidding LOL, JK. Anyway, so it was a fun time. It was a big, it was a big deal in my life when I was 19 to get my braces off. And uh, suddenly boys being interested in me and it was a whole topsy turvy fun time in my life. But um, I went to go work at a summer camp and long story short, I was committed to being Mormon and living Mormon principles. 
And that did not happen. And I uh, did some sinning when I was when I was away at camp. And Aaron and I were falling in love throughout the summer. I come back from camp, working at this amazing summer camp, Camp Ramaka, putting in a good word that if anyone knows another good summer camp, I can work at next summer. Just take a break from all this, relive my happiest glory days of my life working at a summer camp. And I can take my I can take my nine year old, my eight year old with me at the time. Premium. That'd be great. But I got it to some sinning and wasn't sure if I wanted to even stay in the church because I really, that, that partying and that stuff that was pretty much as fun as they said it was. But ultimately came back and thought that it was kind of a sign from God that my, my relationship with my mom, she was just trying to drag me to the bishop's office and things were so tumultuous with her. Uh, and it just was time for me to, I needed to move out. I needed to go to school somewhere else. And it just felt like God placed Aaron Brell in my life at the right place and right time. And it was meant for me to marry him in the temple, repent for all the things that I did. And throughout that process of just repentance and getting myself ready to be a wife, it just felt like you, I had a path before me of comedy and living out this one thing, or I can hopefully do it with Aaron, who's a comedian, who's a headliner and do it with him, do it as, as a Mormon and, you know, be in the good graces of my family. Cause you can really only have, you can really only have sex <laughs> in the, in, with your Mormon family's approval. If you, if you get married and I was not willing to abandon everything that I, that I knew and loved and everything that God had done for me, it felt like at that time to do anything but get married in the temple to a worthy priesthood holder. And so because I had so much of this conditioning and felt like built up sexuality, it just, it felt like God was blessing me at the right place, the right time. And me and Aaron just fell head over heels in love. And I got home August 19th, 2008 from camp and me and Aaron barely knew each other <laughs> when I got home. We barely knew each other, but we we got uh, engaged December 7th and married December 18th. And for everything that is true that there is to say about um, quick engagements and getting married to somebody and committing your life to them and the church and making these covenants before you really know the church, know them and know yourself, all of those things are very true. And there's a lot of process processes to go through as an ex-Mormon who's deconstructing not just the faith, but concepts around marriage and yourself and who you could have been. But ultimately, I am really, really happy that I was lucky enough to get married to Aaron. And our, our journey over the last 15 years has been mostly delightful and wonderful. And you'd be hard pressed to find a better guy. So because Aaron, by the time I met him when I was 19 and he was 25 or 26, he was already beginning to headline and had 50 minutes of comedy and he was traveling around doing comedy at that point. And it just felt like, um, he's the comedian. I will, I will support him. I will work and he can go to school and he can do comedy and he is the pony to bet on. And, uh, because I put in like a decade of doing that, it's really sweet. Cause now he's like, Kara, you're the pony to bet on with starting this podcast and this nonprofit. And that feels really sweet to switch roles and have him have that same type of like love and encouragement that I had for him. So we've, we've always had a pretty, pretty bomb ass relationship to be honest, all things considered with all of the Mormon conditioning. He's only once ever said like, you have to listen to me cause I'm a priesthood holder. And I'm like, really? That's, that's the proof that you're losing the argument right now. <laughs> so. so there was a point in time that came in around 2010, 2011, where Tignataro, hopefully you know her and love her. She's a fantastic comedian and stand up and actress and been in a whole bunch of things. Um, she came through wise guys before she had really gotten famous at all, but I knew her from the Sarah Silverman program that I was obsessed with. And I was like, Aaron, go be the MC so we can get to know Tig this whole weekend. And it was a good idea. Good on me. And we ended up spending a bunch of hours with Tig and talking to her in the car. And she's like, if you uh, ever feel like moving out to LA, you can uh, come work on some projects with me. So by 2011, me and Aaron were ready to quit school and quit work and move down to LA. So it was extremely exciting time in our life when we moved to Santa Monica and we got integrated into the ward there. And I had a bunch of fantastic nanny jobs to support us. And Aaron was on 
Tiggs podcast, Professor Blastoff for three years. And he was able to, you know, introduce us to a bunch of fun comedians and travel the country with her podcast. And I finally was like, whoa, three, I think three years previous to that, I was like listening to Sarah Silverman and taking down notes. And then I'm suddenly like in the green room at the Largo with some of like the best comedians in the world and behind the backstage at Conan and Ricky Gervais is over there and Ed Helms and Sarah Silverman and Mark Marin and met parties at Natasha Legero's house. And who else can I cringily name drop? Garfunkel and Oates. Aaron worked for them for a little while too. Oh, Bill Burr. Bill Burr, since I was in seventh grade, I woke up early when his specials would come on. They'd play at like nine in the morning sometimes on Comedy Central and I didn't want my parents to hear. And I would put my ear up to the TV and take down notes for his jokes to like memorize them and the joke structure and then like perform them um, in my drama class when we'd have like stand up comedy portions like being in the same green room as as Bill Burr and uh, Louis C.K., stuff like that. The, The coolest part, though, about having this relationship with Tig and everything well, yes, there's this portion of it where like we're Mormon and she's like a kind of outspoken, obvious lesbian. It just kind of was that was an elephant in the room. But there's a really famous stand up special that right after Tig was diagnosed with cancer. I mean, I mean, right after this is like 2012. She goes on stage at the Largo. She had this this performance that she had to was already set up. She just gets diagnosed with cancer and she goes on stage and she says, hi, I have cancer. I have cancer. Hi. Hi. She's like, some of you people in the audience are wondering if I'm serious. Yes. I was just diagnosed with cancer stage three breast cancer. I see some of you are crying right now. It's it's okay. It's okay. You'll be fine. I mean, I won't be fine, but you'll be fine. And she just kind of improvs this amazing 30 minute set during one of the darkest times of her life. And one of her jokes is she's like, usually with comedy, it's tragedy plus time equals comedy. I am coming to you where I am just at the tragedy right now. And seeing Tig, who's at this point, like, you know, one of our close friends, being able to put all that she had been through. Her mom has just died. She just went through this horrible breakup. She just had C. diff. We were like in the hospital with her thinking that she was going to die of C. diff before any of this happened. And just all of the stuff she was able, able to, to overcome and put comedy into it. And that's just, again, like that's the, that's the lane of what I've always tried to view life as of like, things suck. Things are tragic. There's going to be a time where we're going to have to look at this tragedy and find the comedy in it. I cannot say enough good things about, about Tig and about the, how inspirational the way that she packaged what she was going through into something that was healing for herself and, and healing for other people for these three years we're living in LA and it it was really some of the happiest times of my life. And, uh, everything though kind of changed one day where my, my world was rocked when my, my older sister, Bethany, who's been like my, my best friend, my entire life, we slept in the same bed from the time I was fourth grade till she left on the, her mission when I was a senior in high school. And I missed her dearly and had to fend for myself abandonment wounds much. And I was like, this church better be true. If Indiana gets her for 18 months. So she was the most faithful Mormon that I could ever manufacture and her commitment and love for God and the church was just unparalleled. So we, we talked on the phone every day. She's the type of sister. I talk on the phone to my sister three hours a day. She was definitely a third wheel in my marriage. So, so it is a, a day that lives in infamy that she, the day she told me that she left the church. Um, so I'm, I'm on a, a backpacking trip with my two older sisters, Bethany and Allison, and we're in Yosemite and we're about to jump into a swimming hole and, and my sister's about to, to jump in and in, in her clothes. And I'm like, what, wait, why are you going to take off your garments or what do you, what are you doing here with this? And she just says to me very nonchalantly, like, Oh, Kara, I don't, I don't wear garments anymore. And I'm like, what? She's like, no, I, I left the church. And I'm like, what? You're joking? What, 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 what? I talk to you every day. What do you mean you left the church? 
were, huh? Uh, no, no, that doesn't. That's you, you let, it's done. You left the church. Like you don't, she's like, yeah, I don't let, I left the church. And I'm like, gay, you, you want to tell me something? She's like, no. And I was like, your, your roommate. She's, she also, I was like, your roommate did this to you. And she's like, no. And I'm like, Jesus, do you, 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 Jesus, you still like him? Huh? And she's like, I don't know yet. And I'm like, and she's like, anyway, gotta go. And it was, it was a real humongous shock to my system that I just had to disassociate from. I could not make sense that my sister, it's like, but you, but it's, the church is true. Like you, it's not hard for you. You don't have a trouble living the commandments. It's obviously a true thing. And it was always coming easy to you. Why in the world would you leave it? Didn't make sense to me. And while I don't want to speak for my sister, Bethany, basically what it comes down to is no, she didn't, she didn't read any of the, the CS letter thing. She didn't know, you know, a lot of the history. It just came down to a person who felt like their spiritual progression was stagnated and she would sit inside the church buildings and just feel like this is not where your home is. This is not where your, your spiritual progression is that the temple and these rituals that this might be serving to somebody else, but Beth, it's not serving to you anymore. And you need to go on your own spiritual journey. And it was heart wrenching for her. And it was, she had to be so nonchalant about it telling me because it was, it was just too painful to really even talk about. And the only person she told was her, her roommate and my mom and so you can imagine how, how devastating it is for somebody where it's like, you know, living the commandments of Mormonism was not hard for me. Like I can do hard things. So for when eventually when my family, the rest of my family, my Mormon family at least found out that she left and my sister-in-law asked my mom, so, so Beth left the church. Why, why'd she leave? And my mom said, you know, she just couldn't hack it. And when Beth found that out, she was like, excuse me, like of anybody I could hack it. It's like, mom, you know that I left because I do not believe that it is true and that it is spiritually serving me anymore. And you, you put, it, it has just shown me since seeing my sister's, you know, deconstruction out of the church and how much you can trust somebody, your secrets and your shame and your confronting of new information and assuming that that person is, is holding space for it and have it be so disrespected when they are kind of retelling your story story. It really did like put a pin in my mind that like you could go through hell and back and your parents could know what you've been through and pretend to empathize with it. But in the day, they're just going to say, couldn't cut it. Just couldn't cut it. It's still true. They just couldn't measure up instead of saying that the church itself did not meet my needs for spiritual fulfillment. So, um, took me three months to even talk to my sister every day. It took three months to even bridge the subject of, okay, so can we talk about why you left the church? And we had a three hour conversation. I remember her going into like, you know what? And also the, the leaders, they've done this and they've done this. And Brigham Young, he was just a racist. And like from a person whose Mormonism, all it meant to me was like, Joseph Smith restored the church. He was a good guy. I'm um, I learned a lot of good principles and morals and has a good community. I don't know anything about the real foundations of the church. I don't know anything about what you're talking about. And I don't want to know either. It sounds devastating to my case. So I just, I couldn't reckon that the best person that I'd known was rejecting the best thing that I'd known. And so that immediately made me just spiral and be like, all right, well, I, I have to know for myself, I cannot rely on anyone else's testimony for sure. So I need to get down to basics of what this gospel really is. And then I, I went and I dug deep and I tried to develop a stronger testimony in every aspect of the church that I could. Cause from the time that I got married and I went through the temple, going through the temple as, you know, a 19 year old or just about anybody, it's a real transition from what it's like to kind of be a kid in the church to now knowing that you are an adult in the church. This is what being an adult in Mormonism means that this, this is the thing that our family did. This is what our parents do when they're in the church. The, the, I, I always had this view that God, he knew my heart and cared about me. And now suddenly he needs handshakes and there's a certain things you have to say. And this is all feeling very 
culty and weird to me. And so all of the the parts of Mormonism that I had kind of put on a shelf that I didn't like, that I didn't, you know, resonate with in the, the Book of Mormon, and I would rather most of my life, you know, read the words of Jesus in the New Testament. Um, and if I'm going to read something or do something spiritual, it's going to be something that, you know, I can look back at that couple hours that I spent and really feel like that was time well spent. And being like, well, is there something wrong with me when I go to the temple? Is there something wrong with the temple? Everything's telling me that it's something wrong with me, that everyone says they have such great experiences. You know, you grow up thinking, I'd love to see the temple going there one day. And you just don't know that you're going to be wearing a green apron and uh, practicing shaking hands with God while putting your hands in the air and going, oh God, hear the words of my mouth. Think that the temple is going to be this ultimate arbiter of all this encompassed spirituality that you've, you've set a goal to be worthy to enter one day. And it just having so much disappointment. And so when my sister left really trying to go back into all of those, the small kind of shelf items of things that I didn't resonate with and trying so hard to, to be like, okay, God, what do you want me to learn from the temple? Cause the first time I went through my mom, I left and I, I was just excited to get married. And that's a hoop that you have to jump through to get married. And, but I remember leaving the temple when I was 19 and saying to my mom, like, so what can I, how can I learn more about that? Like, what, 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 what was that? And she's just like, no, you just go a lot and then you just find meaning in it. So trying to do that through like a lot of my twenties and constantly being like, "Mm." And then, and then just kind of hitting a wall of like, I just don't feel like I'm, I'm, I just don't feel like this is the Jesus Christ that I know and learn about. It's like, he wants me to about serving people. Santa Monica has so many, so many homeless people and so many people in my ward that need help. And if I have a couple extra hours a week, it's really hard for me to believe that the God that I, I worship, he needs us to do these proxy ceremonies for dead people when there are living people in my ward and sleeping outside my building that could use these resources of time and money so much more than me. And so feeling like I just kind of hit this brick wall that there's just going to be things within Mormonism that I'm never going to connect with. But there's, there is this, this figure of Jesus Christ that is supposedly central to it. And that's what, what started this seven year Jesus freak phase. And I've talked a lot about it before and I'll kind of just skip over most of it, but It was the most beautiful, service-oriented, some of the happiest times of my life where I was at these nanny jobs where I was reading the scriptures every day, listening to sermons and podcasts and pretty much everything um, about my, my spirituality and my goals had to do with trying to align myself with the best ideals of, of the Jesus Christ that I was kind of lifting from the New Testament and listening to uh, these nothing but Christian sermons and Christian music and reading Christian books and aligning myself a lot more with this very grace-based version of Jesus Christ. And it, it was beautiful and it was, it motivated me to, to serve others. And I had the sister missionaries in Santa Monica that I was really close with and going out and teaching lessons to people where I technically still totally believed that Mormonism was true, but as long as we're focusing on the the Jesus Christ, it's starting to feel like though that the the missionary program in and of itself was discounting other people's connection with God to fill it in with their Mormon version of of authority and and what is what is supposedly like a, a higher plane that people should get on board with. And I just had so many experiences that were beautiful, but also started to add up on my shelf. This, this shelf that, that, you know, Mormons and ex-Mormons talk about, it's a term coined by Camilla Kimball, the prophet's wife, where when things you just don't understand and things that irk you, you just put it on a shelf and you think that you'll sort it out later. And sometimes that those shelf items, they start to add up and they start to get heavy. And again, going back to this theme of like, I, I believed in God so much. I thought that, you know, every breath that I take is borrowed and loan on loan to me 
by Jesus Christ who redeemed me of my sins. Pretty much all I wanted from the time I was 20 years old was to quit work and start a family and have kids. And it was times like when I, I miscarried, um, when I was like 24 and going through some of like the most heart wrenching things and being able to, to listen to my Christian music and pray and just feel like, just like, you know, Moses in the wilderness that God is, he has a path and he's leading me somewhere. And I am just in, in different in between stages of preparation of highs and lows, but God always has my back and will always lead me to something that he has greater for me. And it's meant to be that you're not supposed to have this, this baby right now. Cause there's something you're supposed to learn from it. There's some trust that you're supposed to be, um, fortifying with your God first before, you know, you're ready to be a bomb. And so everything in my entire life centered around the church and doing missionary work and just trying to, to live out being the best Christian that I could. The easiest way to say that like this, the seven year kind of Jesus freak Christian phase of me jailbreaking Mormonism to, to shoehorn in as much grace and the, the best version of Jesus that I could. It was kind of like me living out my shelf in real time because the, the structure of Mormonism felt really good and it felt, felt good to have a place to serve and a community to go to. And if there was ever an opportunity to bear my testimony, I always wanted to give up, get up and at least be that person that if you went three hours of church and you never heard anyone talk about Jesus Christ and how much he loves you, that I will be that person that can, that can say that and can tell you that you're loved and, and bear my testimony. And it feels, it feels really good sometimes to be used by God and to be looking for the the fruits of that. And is it, is it an actual true thing to me though? No, but of course, if you are, you're trying to love and serve in your community and you're seeing the fruits of that and you're having an elevated emotion and you call it the spirit that is only available within, within this one religion, something's really got to give because at some point it's, it's hard to believe that that God only allows that spirit that you have now jailbroken, like your specific lane of how you interpret Jesus Christ, that you have it right is only available within this religion that you are actually, you, you're not even getting the things that people see and love in you about you is not even a reflection of the Mormonism that you were taught that most people are taught. I didn't get this hyper love and grace and joy and service attitude from listening to conference talks or reading the book of Mormon or going to the temple. I got it because of the, the sermons and the best versions of this, this Jesus Christ, which I could just describe as, as a ubiquitous type of Christ consciousness that is all over the place that I was tapping into. And of course it was happy and served me well, but as time progressed and I had to figure out whether Mormonism was actually true, if the restoration, the proposition of what this church was, if it, if it was actually true, and then having to figure out if the Jesus Christ that I had loved and worshiped and learned about, if, if he was actually a true God and a true deity, that it made sense to worship as such, that was... I guess this next part of the story and the the deconstruction that happened. So it's become apparent to me year by year that the Mormon God is a God of trying to get good PR. And when I was living in Santa Monica, I was asked to be the director of the public affairs council for my stake. And again, like kind of just have some, some pillars of people who are so intelligent and so hardworking and so wonderful in so many ways that you, you think that the things that you're doing that kind of make you feel icky, like, well, if they're doing it, then it must not be bad because look at how smart and intelligent they are. And if they're fine with doing this kind of stuff, then I should be too. So this, this phase of when I was working on the uh, public affairs council, which is just a calling, it's, it's not like a paid position for PR for the church. Um, but the other director that I worked with He's, he's an amazing, amazing uh, screenwriter. He freaking, he's the showrunner for Lord of the Rings. Like he ghost wrote like all of the, the Star Trek movies. Um, 
it was impossible for me to believe in so many ways that the church wasn't true because just some of the smartest, most intelligent, amazing people um, in my stake in Santa Monica believed this church was true. I had this typical interpretation of Mormonism that a lot of people have that like whatever doesn't make sense to me is a me problem and I am on a lifelong journey. I will always stay in this church, but it's it's always going to be a me problem and on this journey I will figure out how to snuff down the things that I don't like to fit within the structure of the LDS church. And so as I went through the training for the public affairs council, just a lot of red flags and alarm bells started going off because there's one thing of when you're in a church, but then when you kind of see the cogs of machine and how they work, you, you really start to see the, you see the man behind the curtain, you see the person pulling the levers and, and how manipulated uh, religion and even down to like spiritual experiences can kind of be. And at our first training meeting, they told us that one of our main jobs was going to be mending relations after Prop 8 in California and the church's role in trying to take away same-sex marriage um, in the state. And, you know, I knew about the phone banks that they had and the money that they poured into it and putting people on buses to to go door knocking. And I'm like, if you if you don't like the bad PR that came out of that, like, can you just not hold yourself accountable? Like, if you didn't like the bad PR, then don't do those types of things. And I wonder if the church regrets even being involved politically in the first place because of everything that came out of it. And so then it's on us as members, individual members, and also, you know, PR and, and public affairs councils to mend those tensions and do it as a calling in our free time because of the revelations and the prophecies and the, the doctrines that, that the, the church itself put into place. And so, yeah, we were supposed to be mending these tensions and they just started to do, we started to do things that I just thought were really icky and, and manipulative. And there were times when we needed a parking garage to be built. The zoning board said no. <laughs> and so it was our job to be like, but we love gay people. What are you talking about? And so we held this entire uh, I don't want to call it like a sham ceremony. It was a nice ceremony, but we held, we held a ceremony in the gym for this gay retired, uh, man from the city council. And, you know, we, it was my job to write an article on it and take pictures of it and take it out to the newspaper and just try to show people that Mormons are awesome. And we were just like so involved in the community and we just like love everybody. Even if I knew that the doctrines don't actually show that and, you know, I, I'm more acquainted even more than ever that I might've had a good experience in Mormonism and I have a place of privilege as like a, a white heterosexual woman. And now realizing that, you know, going to an all Mormon high school wasn't that great for a lot of the kids that I went to school with who were, you know, people of color who were queer and they had a completely different experience. And so to prop up something that I knew was just not universally a good experience for a lot of people and felt like it was a real contradiction to what Jesus said, that if you pray, you, you should do it in private and that if you do it in public, then you have your reward in front of everybody. And that's literally all the public affairs council did is anything that came from that Christ-like instinct in the members to do good and love other people and serve in the community the, the council is there to take pictures of it and write about it so that people know that we're awesome. And I'm like, why can't we just have doctrines and policies and a people that reflect that? It's strange that God needs so much PR help to get this message across. Things like that started to, to weigh on my shelf that just, again, I'm in this hyper Jesus freak phase and I'm starting to realize more and more the manipulation that the church that doesn't act like Jesus Christ, that I don't get a lot of um, Christian like and spiritual fulfillment from, they there's a reason for it. And they, instead of actually making changes to do and be like Jesus Christ, they want to manipulate the perceptions um, for the for the public and for the people. And this 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 gap in this 
this chasm just started to grow within me of the God that I was worshiping and that I understood was just not reflected within Mormonism, but I still thought that it was true and it was still had good morals and I was living the word of wisdom and always wore my garments. But as time went on, I started to, to experiment and do what Jesus said and, and test the word. And, you know, you have kids and you're really tired and you, I got to a point where I had a really hard time believing that my Christian friends, I had two really good Christian friends, never Mormon. And to believe that God withheld blessings from them because they drink coffee or because they're not Mormon, but I am in some way more blessed if I obey this really arbitrary word of wisdom and I can't have coffee and I can drink energy drinks. That's fine. God still gives me all the blessings with monster energy drinks, but not specifically coffee. And I lived a long time being like, okay, it's just, this is just a test of my obedience. And the more that I was like, but let me, let me look into what is the history of the word of wisdom and realizing that it was supposed to just be a word of wisdom. It was not supposed to be a commandment until it was required for entrance into the temple in like the 1920s and starting to feel like, okay, God, you really don't want me to drink coffee. There's really like prophets and members and entire generations of Mormons in heaven right now who drank coffee. But if I do it, that I am less than, and I'm going to be my, my temple recommend is going to be taken away and starting to really feel like the, the rules of the God that I loved and that I worshiped, I could not fit him within Mormonism because there's a lot of good feelings in, in just kind of outsourcing things you don't understand to smarter people. And that it feels good that there's prophets who can interpret the scripture and tell you what to take and what to leave. But it just felt like there were so many add-ons and, and really dogmatic add-ons that withheld blessings and withheld love and comfort from people that were just so arbitrary. And I can see the history and the reasons why they were implemented. And then the things that are the most Christian and the most caring and the most empathetic reflections of who Jesus Christ is, those, those aren't implemented. It feels like a real switcheroosies going on with this. And so for a good portion of my late twenties, I struggled back and forth and I prayed a lot and I tried to figure out who you are, God, and what do you expect of me? And how, how am I blessed? How am I, how, what do I need to do to feel like I am good and I am worthy and I am holy? And especially I think females in the church understand this, that wearing garments can really mess up your, your image of yourself. And there's just so much I could say here, but I mean, really having Jesus Christ be this, this God of grace and love while still living the commandments of Mormonism and just feeling like this, this God that I worship, does he really care about these things? I know that there's this aspect of Mormonism again, that's like, this is a test of your obedience because the more it doesn't make sense, the more that you do it, that means the more faithful you are. But again, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees could have made that same argument. And I'm like, the, the God that I'm worshiping, he dines with prostitutes and the God that I'm worshiping doesn't care about the clothes that you wear. It, he looks at your heart. But so much of Mormonism had to do with outward appearance and God judging these small actions that can just lead to so much scrupulosity when you feel like you're not saved and you're not loved. You're not uh, living up to your covenants because of something that was established so long ago and you're just con constantly like in a, in a conversation of prayer over years and years trying to align your will with what, as you understand it, is God's will. Yeah, there came a point where I started to experiment on how do I feel when I take off my garments? And I never, I never was the type of girl who would ever take off my garments. This gun show, it was hidden from the world, let me tell you. Like there'd be times where I was at the beach in Santa Monica with my older sister, Allison, and her leaving the church was not a big deal. She was snowboarding and smoking weed with her boyfriends and she was like 15, but 
there's a time where she's like, yeah, now let's go walk around the mall, the second street promenade. And I'm wearing like short shorts and my bathing suit top. And I'm like, no, no, like I can't. There was swimming at the beach, but now we are not doing the activity of swimming. I have to go walk. We need to go walk home to 11th street. I have to go put on my garments, put on a modest outfit, and then we can go shopping. It's not because I thought I was going to be like struck by lightning or anything. But when you feel like you're like, I made a very serious commitment to God to wear these at all times. And if it's within my control in any way, I have to show God that I am committed to this, that I'm not trying to skirt his rules, that I understand that I am one of the chosen people who gets to wear such a, it's a blessing to wear these. And I would be remiss. I would be disrespectful to God if I don't go home and, and put this on, if I have the opportunity to do it. And I like had a full blown panic attack. I was crying. <laughs> it was right before my sister's wedding too. She's like, I need to go look for bridesmaids dresses. Why are you freaking out at me, Kara? And I'm like, you don't understand. You're being disrespectful of my religion. Like wearing garments was really serious to me. And so the opportunity to be like, the world is my oyster. I get to choose any kind of underwear that I want to wear. And I actually still only wear boy shorts. It's true. Garments, they uh, conditioned me to never want my thighs to touch. So that was the only truth of that. But just being hot and sweaty and and having a uh, feeling like your body is really not your own to express yourself in. And that at all times, the the garments, which have changed over the years and could change again, all up to the dictates of whatever, you know, the quorum of the 15 have to decide what length my shirts have to be at. It just, it felt so out of alignment with personal revelation and God knowing what my heart said. So around 2019 is when I started experimenting with these types of things, all the while still being very Christian and very, very conservative. And at this point, I'm a young mom and I have two kids that I feel like were just beautiful, beautiful births that I, I chalked up to them being so beautiful and motherhood being so beautiful and wonderful and all of the hard parts feeling like God was blessing me through all of them because I was following the path that a woman should take. And I, I just, I leaned in more and more into what it means to be like a Christian woman and therefore like what it means to be a very conservative stay at home mom woman while Aaron was in school. So I'm taking care of my kids and the, the community and the ward that I lived in at the time was amazing. I, you could have given me the CES letter at that time and I never would have been able to, to read it. I would have found every apologetic and spun it and ignored everything because there was a time in which all of those shelf items were so packed away because I had these young kids and I had my whole life was my other Mormon mom friends that I could walk out the door at the student housing at the U and have nothing but friends to talk to and playmates for my kids. The idea of leaving the church and being ostracized, I, I would have done anything to, uh, to reject that fate for myself. Listening to like Ben Shapiro every single day and uh, Gavin McGinnis every single day and if you don't know who Gavin McGinnis is, I only say that to show how conservative I was. I'm listening to all of Gavin's like really old episodes where they're mostly just really funny and really raunchy comedy. And that was, again, that was the one loophole that I felt like God let me have as I'm allowed to listen to really raunchy comedy. And um, it's, it's a crazy journey I've been on from a girl who uh, used to listen to the Gavin McGinnis show every day to just this week, the... The other person who took over the Proud Boys, what is it, Joe Biggs, was just sentenced to like 17 years for him and other Proud Boys storming the Capitol, you know? So I was at this point where I'm very conservative and I've never told this following story before and I hope that it comes across and I get the point across that I want to get across because this was a humongous turning point in my life. Um, so there's one day where I, I ran a kind of, very Mormon, Christian, hyper-conservative, funny, jokey uh, Twitter account. And I I had a good little sized following. And if you remember when Steven Crowder, the YouTuber, the conservative, used to do those videos, like change my mind. And he'd sit at a booth and he'd have 
college students come up and they talk about topics. And obviously he was never open to actually changing his mind. He just wanted to debate with what he viewed as like, you know, woke SJWs. And a lot of people are into that. I was into that back in the day. And he was having a discussion about abortion with this college student, this girl, to like win his argument. He said something that I was just like, well, why are you lying? Wait, wait, I, I'm a conservative. Why are you lying? Yeah, they're talking about the topic of abortion. And he's like, you just, just practice abstinence. Everyone should just practice abstinence. And the girl's like, it's really hard. It's not that easy to practice abstinence. Like if you want to get rid of abortion, like be realistic. Come on, dude. And he goes, it's not that hard to practice abstinence. I was abstinent before I was married. It's not that hard. Everyone can do it. And I remember thinking, I'm like, if we want to talk about, you know, we really believe that like people are murdering babies and abortion is a real serious topic that we actually care about. We need to be honest how difficult being abstinent is. And Steven Crowder, you weren't abstinent because I know on episode 11 of the Gavin McGinnis show, you went on, it's behind a paywall, but you went on and you said that you had all kinds of sex before you were married. And it obviously it wasn't that easy. Why are you acting like you did it? Everyone else can do it. And you were, you are a Christian and it, you still didn't do it. So I took to my Twitter and I said, what I did not know would turn into an absolute shitstorm. <laughs> I'm really uh, feeling some disenchantment with Steven Crowder lately. Um, I explained the story of what I just said, and I'm like, if we want to talk honestly about this kind of stuff, why can't we just be honest about how difficult abstinence is when Steven Crowder himself had sex before he was married? And I was not prepared for all of my followers, everybody on conservative Twitter. I'm talking like even big name YouTubers who had their own shows were retweeting me and trashing me saying, of course he was absent. Of course he was a virgin before he got married. Why are you, why are you lying, Kara? And I'm like, everyone hold your horses. Let me go behind the paywall and I will show you. And I went on my phone and I recorded Steven Crowder saying all this stuff about all the sex that he had before he was married. And I'm like, surely when I present everyone with the evidence of what I am talking about, they will come around and say, Oh, now we see. But of course that did not happen. And that was the day that the fun died. <laughs> and uh, if you ever want to know part of the reason why I got my name Nuanto, it's because when I was on Twitter, I was friends with this conservative leaning um, YouTuber named Nuance Bro. And he, he and I were friends and we DM sometimes. And he was the only person who actually heard me out who was nuanced enough to be like, okay, I'll wait for the evidence. I was against you, but okay. And I had to like shut down my computer because the amount of people still trying to trash me, assuming that I was just trying to come for, for their man, Steven Crowder. And I was just like, you know, ev represented everything they hated. And I'm like, no, I would like to solve this problem with you guys, but I would like to actually address it with some seriousness because Steven Crowder's Christian. I was Mormon. I know how hard it is to not have sex before getting married and how, how easily people can get pregnant and have babies out of wedlock and all of those things. I know even for me, it was hard. So you're, I'm like, we can't have an honest conversation about how people who are not religious, who don't even have those standards, how that is just not realistic that most people are going to practice abstinence. And the only other option that I can see is like, like well-informed sex education at the bare minimum. And I completely realized how evidence makes no difference to somebody when they are stuck in, in their dogmas and in their arguments being right, even with presented with evidence and people changing the definitions of words. And there's a YouTuber who was trying to trash me, Lauren something or other, can't remember her name now. She went to BYU, but she's not Mormon. If anyone knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, and she was like, no, you got it all wrong. Abstinence means like you just don't have sex for a certain period of time. That's what he meant. He, was, he practiced abstinence and, and I couldn't, I couldn't believe that I was like, so you're, you're, you're proven wrong that, that he, he said he didn't have sex. He's gone on all these, he's been on Fox news and all these things saying that he was a, he was a virgin and he didn't have sex for marriage. And that's interchangeable basically with him practicing abstinence. Abstinence as he's using it in this argument with this college student is supposed to be like a slam dunk point of like, 
I didn't have sex. It's not that I didn't have sex for four months. It's I didn't have sex before I was married because the having sex before marriage means that you were putting the woman you're having sex with in a position to become pregnant. So why can't, if we want to avoid pregnancies like this, we have to, we have to just, we're going to change the definitions just to score points and arguments. And I had a real unified front with nuance, bro. And I just, I fell out of love with, with, with anybody who, when they're presented with evidence, can't change their minds and need to reinterpret things. And that was a, an important kind of like experience and stake in my psyche to be like, man, I never want to be like that. When I'm presented with evidence, please, Lord, let it change my mind. Things kind of went on as normal. And I was working for a very conservative nonprofit at the time. And Aaron, unbeknownst to me, was we were, we were remodeling a house. And while I'm listening to like my sermons and Gavin and Ben Shapiro every day, Aaron's listening to uh, Mormon Matters and Mormon Stories podcasts. And sometimes I'd be like, what you listening to there? And I mean, I was so anti, anti-Mormon that there was a time in which I got a brand new journal to write down all my sermons and everything that I was learning in my, my spiritual journal. And I thought that Mormon Stories was was a, was a faith promoting podcast. And I listened to this episode that I really liked about sexuality in like 2011. And it was like at the top Mormon stories, John Dillon, da, 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 and I wrote it all, everything down. And I like ripped that page out of my journal. Once I realized what Mormon stories was, cause I didn't want somebody to find my journal on accident and think that Kara was listening to apostates like John Dillon. And I told that story in my Mormon stories interview with John. And it was kind of cute to be like, look at us now, <laughs> you know, but uh, that's how repulsed I was by, you know, anybody speaking negatively about my church. Like I still was very much in that phase. Well, if Aaron was like a one issue lever, it, he, he was trying to understand the, the reasons why people are gay. And of course, you know, people are born gay and we have a church that treats LGBTQ individuals like they are broken. And he was, he was better than I in that way. And he recognized that the church is just not one size fits all for everybody. And he was just repulsed by the way that it was treating queer people. And he was like a single issue lever on that. Well, I was working for a very conservative nonprofit and very conservative myself and on this, this Jesus train. And so we left for, for very different reasons and things I was, I was holding together my faith in Mormonism um, and just kind of grasping at straws, but I couldn't imagine my daughter, you know, not getting baptized by her dad and stuff like that. Like I still completely wanted to keep going with this, this shoehorning in this, this Jesus-y structure into Mormonism. And, and maybe I won't wear my garments, maybe I'll drink coffee, but I still want to take my kids to church and I still want to teach them about Jesus. And I want them to attend church as much as possible and serve in the ward and everything. There was no question in my mind that I was still going to stay Mormon when Aaron finally told me that he was, he was done and he was never going to go to church again. So that was the last time he went was Easter 2019. And it really wrecked me. And I had to, I had to cry a lot and I had to be like, it's going to, I can't, I can't do this without you. Like I, I had this idea of what my life was going to be with this worthy priesthood holder who's going to lead our home and baptize our kids. And it's a really crushing blow to think of your life where your, your spouse isn't on the same page with you religiously anymore. And you just don't align, but you know, deep down that like, I mean, technically, yes, you're right. Like the things about gay people are that's, that's true. But like, can we just, can we, why can't we just keep going and still figure this out? And and, and the, for him, it was just a hard no. And that was, that was a tough pill to swallow. So a few months go by and July 12th, 2019 is when I'm like, okay, I'm, I've been taking my kids to, to church by myself. And I just, am like, but what, what are the arguments that ex Mormons have? Why, why do people leave the church overall? What's I want to, if I can steal man their position, what are their arguments? Why do people leave? I really didn't even know. And so I went out searching and remember the first thing that I watched basically was a YouTube video on the book of Abraham. And that was 
it was hard to even move on just from that. Growing up in seminary, and you could probably have 10,000 hours or more of instruction on your religion from seminary to Sunday school throughout your entire life, and then be like a 29, 30-year-old woman and be like, I guess I didn't know where that canonized scripture came from. I have all of the scriptures from Scripture Mastery still memorized. And uh, Abraham and I stood among these leaders and I saw that they were good. And the Lord said unto me, thou arst one of them, thou wast chosen before thou wast born. Like, I can, I can, I can tell you a lot about the scriptures, but I can't tell you about how they became uh, integral to our theology and became doctrine. And I realized through watching this YouTube video, the history of the book of Abraham, that Joseph Smith basically trying to be a big shot prophet uh, during this Egypt mania that was kind of going on at the time in the 19th century, that uh, some sarcophaguses were coming through town. He sees these common Egyptian funerary texts and says, these are written by the hand of Abraham. And everyone's like, the hand of Abraham? He's like, yeah, if you guys can get us some money, put, put, pull it together, I can translate these and uh, I'll tell you what it says. And, you know, he has his journal of what this character is equates to this. And every Egyptologist on earth says that he got it wrong. And when something that your prophet says is from the hand of Abraham, it's, that's serious. That's a serious claim to make. And it has nothing to do with Abraham written in an entirely different time period. And just turns out to be exactly what you'd expect to find with a mummy, but it's like, he's playing big shot prophet and using that mantle to be able to kind of con people and fool people and seeing the pieces of that when put together really spell out that he is a fraud that this book of Abraham, the way that way that it came about is indistinguishable from a fraud. And there's no, there's kind of no going back from that, that pieces like that, that I started to realize on this July 12th, as I read and discovered more things about Mormonism that I never realized and I never heard of before that were really a shock to my system. But the more pieces I put together, realizing that he, he, he was, he was a con man. So either God wants me to believe in somebody who does a lot of fraudulent con like behaviors and, but, but every, every other type of religious leader who would do the same thing, I would never believe in. And I would completely think was just bullshitting me, but I'm supposed to suspend that, that disbelief for this one in this instance for this religion. And then the more things I read, the more is just there's the shelf cracked and there's no going back from it. And the book of Abraham was, was the, was the biggest piece I would have to say. And then I'm like, Aaron, get in here. <laughs> Cause Aaron hadn't even read any of this stuff. Like I said, he was like a single issue lever with around the church, how the church was treating queer people. There's just, there's no place in the plan of salvation for these people. I'm like, screw that. That's, that's not the God of love that I want to think of and worship. And so I'm like, Aaron, get in here. And he's pulling up the CES letter. And I was like, did you know that Joseph Smith married like 30 to 40 women and like mother daughter pairs and, and sister pairs and did all of this behind Emma's back. And that like, he, he started polygamy because there's this thing in, in your Mormon head where you really think of like Brigham Young, Brigham Young was the guy who just rolled with an iron fist. He got the saints out West. Good for him. And then he went a little bit crazy, taking a lot of wives Joseph was this inspired prophet and Brigham Young. I'm going to put a lot of the stuff he did on a shelf. We'll figure that out in the afterlife. I don't know the truth of how much prophetic mantle he had. Brigham Young was the crazier one, but definitely Joseph Smith was a very inspired prophet. And he just, maybe he had like two or three wives, but he, he was very, but he, he did it very kosher and there was no sex. I might not understand, but he definitely had his reasons. And starting to put the pieces together of he, Joseph Smith acted like just about every other con man, but all of that still, this is how faithful I was. I remember thinking like, I can still say to myself, I don't understand it, but it'll all make sense. One day I just have to keep having faith. There's reasons that I'm humble enough to say, 
I, I don't know better than God. This is still his prophet. These are the things that he did. I was willing to still put all of that on the shelf, but I'm like, I was always taught that Joseph Smith couldn't write the book of Mormon. And I was still under that belief that j there's no way that this, you know, uneducated farm boy could put together all of these pieces and write such an intricate story. And you hear your whole life of really intelligent people who convert to the church and are really amazed with the, the structure and the narrative and the details of the book of Mormon. And I'm like, there's just so many people who have been converted to the book of Mormon. Yes. Because of like, it's, it's, it has this spirit that converts them, but also supposedly a real page turner. <laughs> and I'm like, but then how, how did he write the book of Mormon? So then I spent the next few hours into like the wee hours of the morning realizing that it was just a, a 19th century work that there's so many things from Joseph's milieu and so many plagiarisms you could say that end up in the book of Mormon, that the, if this is a book that is the keystone of my religion taught my entire life to draw a little, little arch and that it's the keystone of our religion yet it doesn't have doesn't have the archaeological evidence that I was led to believe that it has it doesn't have linguistic evidence to support it and there's so many anachronistic things within it that make no sense for an ancient book that's written on these golden plates that's taken from the brass plates of Laban and traveled across with Lehi and his family that are just too anachronistic to make sense within this book that it fits perfectly within um, everything else in Joseph's character to to be a fraud and to try to play a big shot prophet. But there's there's a reason why the Book of Mormon actually isn't as inspired and amazing as I was always led to believe that it is, that it has a lot of holes and it makes sense a lot more about how he was able to produce it. And it's it's not that amazing, really. It's actually quite common. So with all of those different things I was able to discount when I'm, I, when I was really able to see how Joseph Smith wrote the book of Mormon and where the, the temple that for so long that I felt so uncomfortable in the ways that he took these things from Freemasonry and all of the attitudes around women and polygamy that, you know, we, we kind of joke in, in Mormonism that like, Oh, it'll be fun if we're sister wives in heaven. Like these are really serious doctrines and the only reasons they were abandoned were so that that the, the doctrines that were never supposed to be abandoned were uh, because the saints out in Zion, because they they wanted statehood, but they never would have given up polygamy um, if they if they could. And if they didn't, then I would be living just like the FLDS. I would be living just like Warren Jeffs, that the ways that Joseph Smith acted is. And when you're Mormon, you're repulsed by, you know, the break off sex of, of Mormonism. And starting to realize that if it wasn't for these hard and fast reforms to Mormonism, I'd be living a church that's basically no different from them. It was pressures from the outside in. It wasn't the, the church's leadership that was rising to this occasion and losing all of my, my faith and my belief that felt so good, like I said, that to believe in prophets who can lead and guide a church when you want to make, when you believe in the scriptures and the Bible and that God does call prophets and he has a savior in Jesus Christ. And it feels good that you can rely on these prophets to tell you the truth of it and starting to realize this mess of all of these failed prophecies and all of these changed doctrines and just one after the other, there's no putting that in any kind of uh, faithful, just, just keep enduring to the end type of spin anymore. It's, it's just not a true thing. And so I grappled with that that night. And I was like, just realized I was like, wow, I'm, I, I, I don't believe it's true. I started the beginning of the night being like, what are ex Mormon's problems to, um, the wee hours of the morning being like, and I, I'm an ex Mormon now. I am never going in a church building ever again. It is, it's a not true thing. Wow. So all this time, it was a not true thing. Okay, now that's just, that's baseline where I was at. Because there were other times where I, I really lost a lot of my respect for the prophets, especially after doing so much PR work and then having the, being such a big part of the I'm a, I'm a Mormon campaign that the church had and, and knowing how much work 
you know, my council and the missionaries and stuff when I was living in LA put into the I'm a Mormon campaign. And I really liked the I'm a Mormon campaign. Then for after, after Monson died and Russell Nelson took over, I remember exactly where I was in my living room. It was like a moment again that shall live in infamy. I remember hearing Russell M. Nelson on uh, the TV during conference. I was like standing in my kitchen when he said, will you remove the Lord's name from the church and you use the word Mormon? That is a win for Satan. And I just remember slowly turning back to the TV, having like a, what, how did this, are you, are we, did we forget about that whole entire campaign? And then coming to learn that like a lot of people woke up that day and said, you cannot just make this like your little pet project, your pet peeve since the nineties, Russell M. Nelson. Like this is, this is a serious shift in how we understand what we're supposed to do and what we're supposed to say. And for one prophet and previous ones to, to like the word Mormon. And for now it's, it's not just passe. It's not just out of style. It is a win for Satan and you speak for God and you oppose Satan. And you are now saying, that the last prophet, he worked for Satan and everything that we did on your councils that were directed by your leaders and all of the missionary work and all of the campaign for I'm a Mormon, that was all for Satan is what you're saying. I was like, this is, this is a major deal. This is me falling completely out of love and completely changing the respect that I once had for this leadership to know how to guide this church. And it feels feels kind of good though at, at the same time to be like that intuition that you've had that you've known all along that like these 80 90 year old men not only are they they really just men of their time and they prove it year by year there is an intuition inside you and me and all of us that we are we are better in line to to understand god and understand ourselves than these men are because they can't even be consistent from one prophet to the next. But as shocking as it was to my system to kind of wake up this, that, that next morning, July 13th, um, and be like, I'm have to live a life where Mormonism isn't true. As shocking as that was to my system, there still came with huge relief because I'm like, great. Cause I just want to worship Jesus Christ. I just want to be a Christian. I want to go to a Christian church and I want to love God and serve God and be this type of Christian that I've always wanted to be. And so it kind of felt like, okay, good. Okay. I have to deal with a lot of the stuff that I was taught and it's going to be a difficult transition, but I had two really good Christian friends and it felt like that's what was right and what God was leading me to, to do and to be. Um, and then I still was looking for signs and ways that God was showing up for me. And that next morning I, uh, I don't know. I'm going to tell this part of the story because it's, it's just cute and it's meaningful to me. I don't know if you care, but I, I woke up the next morning and I really loved the, uh, UK X factor, big fan downloaded all the torrents and wasn't available in the U S but there's this girl named Ella Henderson who was on the X factor and followed her YouTube channel. And that next morning she had just dropped this new song and I clicked play on it and it just felt like the exact song that just sang to my soul and what I was going through and what I needed to hear at that exact moment. And damn you, uh, YouTube copyright that I can't play it for you right now. But basically the lyrics, as we know from my earlier demonstration, I am not a singer, nor do I claim to be, but the lyrics, I'm going to sing it for you because it's there's just certain songs that help you through your faith crisis where you're like, mm. and it goes like, I'll keep it simple and try to explain, but it's harder to say than you think when it comes from a dark place. Like we all want to win, but life ain't a game. So why do we keep pushing and driving ourselves till we're insane? All right. I can't sing this part. We got to live with the, we've, we got to live with the choices we make, but if we get it wrong, we can blame no one when it's your sanity. That's at stake. Please don't lose your light. You'll lose your mind. Please don't lose your light. You'll lose your mind. We got flaws in all of us, but that's what makes us glorious. Time goes by in front of us. So let's just make it 
glorious. Can we quit paying attention to opinions and perfection before we run out of you? Oh, we got laws in all of us. So let's just make it glorious, glorious. Anyway, I was like, that's it. That's it. That you will drive yourself insane trying to make pieces work and fit into somebody else's puzzle that is so abstract and I'm leaving the church. I got to live with the choices that I'm making now, but whatever people's judgments are, whatever comes, I know that I have a good spark within me that cannot be put under this bushel of shame that I'm leaving the church now. Everything will work out okay. Can we quit paying attention to the heated, sheeted, this or that, the rules, everything, when people will drive themselves insane and the very essence that makes you, Kara, the very essence that makes you, listener, that if you keep trying to just fit yourself into these answers, that we will run out of you, the very thing that makes you. And I was like, mm, Ella, you should have won X Factor. I love you so much. So from that point forward came the even harder part of deconstructing my belief in a literal deity, a literal Jesus Christ, and realized that I don't have a good reason to actually believe that he is divine, that he is God, and that that version of Jesus that I'd been taught is basically just a combination of a bunch of different writings that, that didn't even take place at the time that Jesus lived, and I don't have a good reason to believe in that deity or really any other deity. And that was one of the darkest nights of my soul, for real. And I got to the point where there's there's no room for faith when I can see how man-made this construct of God is and what this Christ figure that I've been taught about is. And yeah, that was one of the darkest, hardest moments of this entire journey um, because, you know, I didn't really know what else then to turn to. You can leave Mormonism and still feel like there's a God who's leading and guiding you, but then you get to the point where you don't have that to fall back on. But ultimately, that is, that's actually good news. And I'll end with kind of telling you where things went from there and, and <laughs> I was able to work things out from that point forward. So it truly came down to, like I said at the beginning, it came down to a feeling of abandonment by, by everything, feeling very abandoned that everything that I thought that led me to hear was just empty and that there's no real Jesus this entire time. And that was way harder than recognizing that the church wasn't true. And at this time, uh, my dad was in the hospital and I was actually able to go fly out and see my dad and thought that he was going to die right as I stopped believing in God altogether and in Jesus Christ. I, I had to fly out to go see my dad in the hospital, which just happened to be in Louisville, Kentucky, which just happens to be where this pastor, Kyle Eidelman, that I had been listening to his Christian sermons for seven years. And it's like two days after I lost my faith in God altogether. And my mom called me and she's like, we're in Louisville and your dad's going into open heart surgery. Get out here. It's a big, long story, but I won't get into. But basically it was, it was heart wrenching that this God, that this pastor Kyle Eidelman, who I'd spent seven years listening to him, tell me about this beautiful, wonderful, grace-based version of Jesus Christ that guided so many decisions of my life that I had to stand in front of him and like thank him for, for those teachings, for what they're worth, but admit that I don't believe in the actual divinity of Jesus Christ anymore to his face. So it was he was lovely and wonderful in every way still and invited me back to hang out with the Christian worship band. And I was like, this is so amazing. I might believe in God again, but no. <laughs> so yeah, it was really, really hard. And it wasn't a conclusion that I wanted to come to. And telling my parents was also extremely difficult because there is a part of saying like, I'm leaving the church, but I'm still Christian. You don't have to worry about anything, you know, or like, and I'm still conservative. You don't need to worry about me. But by the time that I told my mom that I wasn't Mormon, or Christian, or conservative anymore. She uh, kind of short-circuited and kind of spazzed out like a robot with water that got thrown on it and uh, has kind of been that way ever since. 
And uh, I think we all want to feel loved and understood by our parents. And when they have this capacity to put their beliefs aside for a sec, you'd hope that they are able to listen to you and understand where you're coming from. But I've realized that my relationship with my parents will never really be anything like that again. It won't be the type of enriching relationship it was back then and gotten to the point realizing that like, you know, if what I'm saying or who I am or what I'm wearing isn't pro Mormon or pro conservative to them, it's not worth listening to. It doesn't matter if I'm their daughter, if I'm not pro Mormon and I'm not conservative, then I am not worth listening to. And, uh, throughout this time, my mom knew that my husband was leaving and she sent me an article from LDS living and was like, Hey, this is from a faithful LDS therapist. Who's like, you know, here's some advice on how to make the church work for people who are doubting. Just do what I do in marriage counseling and just have them look at the best aspects of the person. But in this case, just look at the best aspects of the church. Don't focus on the bad parts. And my mom sends this to me. She's like, maybe this article could help your husband look at the church more positively and maybe he'll come back. And she's like, have you shared it with him yet? And a couple of weeks go by and I'm like, mom, I have some bad news. <laughs> have some bad news. And, um, it's just, no, it's not as simple as saying like, just look at the positive aspects. It'd be like if I was married to a spouse and I find out that they're living an entire li double life or something, it's, it's apples and oranges. And so there's just so many narratives that Mormon parents spin that like, you know, oh, one person leaves then if my daughter leaves, like you drag them down to Satan. So I hope that my parents don't blame my husband too much that he uh, led me out because we're all on our own journey and he left for his own reasons. I left for my own reasons. There's no way around it. It's just really hard. And it's, it's been an uncomfortable conversation with my mom from the very start. And just again, telling your parents that what they believe isn't true for you feels like an entire assault to all of the work that they put in to raising you. And there's really no amount of explaining why I left and how I view things in the four years that have ever made them really see me any different. And that's just a lifetime of indoctrination for you. Trained their brain to only see what keeps the indoctrination alive. But ultimately the things that I believed as a Christian are a lot of the th same things that I think I believe now, just in a different context. Like I used to believe as a Christian that God put a hymn sized hole inside of you that can only be filled with himself. And I believed that, you know, for a very long time. And so when you see people who get into drugs and sex and alcohol and filling everything in that space to just try to feel whole, when they need to come to Christ. And now on this side of it, I believe that yes, we all have traumas and things that are wounds. And like I mentioned at the beginning, it's like a wound of what? And sometimes that's an abandonment wound. What am I going to fill that with? And for some people, they're going to fill that with their, their best friend in Jesus. I, I trust in him and everything will work out. And if you're looking for evidences that, that God loves you and he cares about you, you, you absolutely will find all of those, but then you'll find that in every different type of religion, and that's, that's not unique to Mormonism. It doesn't make Mormonism any more true. I come to find out, you know? So I think that's just indicative of just life's journey in the, the last three to four years since I left the church. There's still, there's still holes in all of us. There's still like holes in inside of me that this whole this summer, um, it's been one of the hardest times of my entire life, to be honest, and doing some of the most intense work on myself that can't be put off by just believing in a religion that will fill it, you know, like what type of person am I after those wounds that I spoke about, like in my childhood, after those wounds are inflicted and what are the mechanisms throughout my life that I've used to fill those with? And, and I'm, I'm happy that the road that I've been able to take is just a place of continually inviting and coming home to myself. And it's like taking the glasses off and hook and being like, there you are, Peter, you know? And in the four years since leaving, um, it's been kind of a wake up and it's been recognizing that the Jesus Christ and the God that I loved and I worshiped, that that was me all along. And I have 
within myself, I have an amazing capacity to love. And all I needed to do was just direct that to myself. Why did all of that power that I had, had to feel like something so high and mighty had to love me that had to come from the outside? Like, what if I am made whole because uh, being re- redeemed first and being loved first by myself in ways that only I can I can love and only I can know and ever truly feel completed by. And spending so much time searching for answers on what is right and wrong and what direction to take and filled with so much anxiety because you've never settled into yourself to say like, it's okay, baby girl. <laughs> like, it's okay. Just take a second. Let's talk things these these things out. Like, you're held. You're fine. You're safe. There's nothing wrong as long as we can just go deeper. Like, let's just go deeper, deeper than deep. And it's, it's not because you, you can't feel held. It's because you haven't exercised that autonomy to find that deity within yourself. Like your respect of yourself and your integrity and authenticity has been sharpened like a knife and you need to give yourself several pats on the back because people go their entire lives, never stepping into their power and their potential and you've done it. And so you, you exercise on that. You realize what you can do. And you've decided to, you know, take a little bit different of a road than everyone else around you is taking. But because your wounds are so deep that your approach and the seriousness that you take to applying healthy principles to achieve actual healing should also be as deep. And I used to say that, like, I could only have confidence and feel okay in myself and feel like good if there's a God watching me and I'm performing for them. And I just think that that is a very corrosive type of spirituality because you're outsourcing it to, to, to something that only really cares about itself that you will ultimately never be in alignment with because it's such an unaccountable, amorphous God, kind of like realizing that this whole system is like living under a narcissist control that like wants your power, but you can do more with it in your hands. And when you realize that you'd never give it away again, you'd never give it away to somebody to use it and abuse it. And so if I already started this Christian journey, um, just believing that, you know, everybody has this God-shaped hole in them that they're going to try and fill with other things. Um, I can't say that still isn't true to a certain extent, that there's there's wounds and there's wounds of abandonment and there's places where um, I'm still not coming home to yet, but that's that's the goal, that's the plan. <laughs> and that's it's just like the scriptures say that you need to experiment on the word. And if it's a good tree, it will bear good fruit. But like the word is in and of itself, it's supposed to be an experiment and it isn't supposed to be dogma. I am an experiment. We are all experiments. We all have to test out and work out like our development and our intuitions. And so what do you do after leave Mormonism? You experiment and you allow yourself to feel secure in a home that you have built, the home of your mind that you have built yourself of like, Hey, well, everyone wants to know, what do you believe now though? It's like, I believe in myself. I believe that we're all on a journey. I believe that we experiment as human beings and that we have the capacity to, to be exploited and to exploit others. And we all have to work out these wounds and in hopes of reducing harm. And cause sometimes when you're Mormon, you just, people, you know, they feel horrible that they taught people on their mission or they did things, you know, that you feel like you exploited other people or you lied to them or whatever. And just coming to the point where you realize that this life we're on a journey and we're all part of humankind. And it's, it's all bigger than the LDS church. It's all just a measure of how easy it can be to give up your consciousness and give away your intuition to give it away to somebody else who will not use it or respect it. And that there is a church that can do a lot of good things but it can also manipulate you in a lot of ways and tell you that those positive experiences, that they, th- those are unique and they own those, that those are only found there. That's just not true. Those feelings are not unique. And so you snuff down a lot of your critical thinking and you snuff down your doubts and uh, snuff down especially your empathy in favor of continuing with their orthodoxy. But... I guess I would say that my beliefs in Mormonism center so much around like what I believed was a a good God who loved me and cared about me and 
showed me that by sending me servants to bless me. But that dogma and that these stupid man-made confines that squeeze all the goodness out of the church um, by its choices to serve its own dogma instead of the people. So I left and couldn't be happier to be in the sex hormone space and watching people step into themselves and come home to themselves. So the beginning, you know, I introduced myself. It's Kara. I'll do it again. Hi, I'm Kara. I'm a messy person, a messy person who loves other messy people in a messy, messy space. And just because I'm an ex-Mormon and I'm not Christian, whether or not he exists or Jesus existed or not, I'm not an ex mourning with those who mourn and I'm not an ex leaving the 99 to go after the one. Uh, I uh, wrap up by saying that I love and respect you, whoever you are, because you can only be what life has made you be. And for that, whatever relationship with yourself or a religion, I wish you well on your journey. And if you are somebody who's been in the process of changing your beliefs in the truth claims of Mormonism or something else, I just leave you with this, this wrap up and this word of encouragement to look for the places in which, um, maybe the church told you that it was the answer to something. And maybe it was maybe at that time and point in your life, that was the only way for you to, to get out of the situation you're in or rise to the occasion or whatever it may be, but that it is possible that there are good people everywhere and there are serendipitous things that happen and there are elevated emotions that exist that are ubiquitous to every different religion around the world. And all different types of spiritual practices can bring people peace. And it doesn't mean that it has to just exist in one place. And those are the only places where that happiness exists. So that is my story of how I left the Mormon church, how I believed it, and why I left. I hope that this first episode of the new podcast made a good impression on you. Hope that if you uh, want more, you can subscribe and it'll be on all of your favorite podcasting platforms and YouTube and, uh, if you see being a donor to my nonprofit and furthering this podcast in your future, I'm not here to tell you what to do, but if it fits within your budget to join my Patreon and uh, become a donor, the links are below for that. So thank you guys so much. Everyone's been so, so supportive of this launch and it's been humbling and overwhelming. We've got many, many episodes of the Mormon History Hoedown coming. So thanks for listening. And again, if you're in Salt Lake, come out to my launch party on September 9th. Love you so much.